So now we're going to talk about the Brayton cycle and we're going to first talk about for power plant electricity generation. I'm going to show a video. I think it's a good video. Let's try and see if I can get this to work. <sighs> Air. A lot of gaseous molecules floating all around us. It's great for breathing and it turns out it's great for getting lights turned on. That's because air, along with abundant natural gas or other fuels, are the ingredients that combine in a gas turbine to spin the generator that produces electric current. If you follow the electricity you use at home or at work back through the power lines to your local power plant, you'll see that the process most likely starts with the work of the gas turbine of the power plant. First, air is drawn in through one end of the turbine. In the compressor section of the turbine, all those air molecules are squeezed together, similar to a bicycle pump squeezing air into a tire. As the air is squeezed, it gets hotter and the pressure increases. Next, fuel is injected into the combustor where it mixes with the hot compressed air and is burned. This is chemical energy at work. Essentially, this is what happens in your family car's engine, but at about 2,900 times more horsepower. Actually, it's exactly like the turbine engines on jet airplanes. The hot gas created from the ignited mixture moves through the turbine blades, forcing them to spin at more than 3,000 RPMs. Chemical energy has now been converted into mechanical energy. The turbine then captures energy from the expanding gas, which causes the drive shaft, which is connected to the generator, to rotate. That generator has a large magnet surrounded by coils of copper wire. When that magnet gets rotating fast, it creates a powerful magnetic field that lines up electrons around the coils and causes them to move. The rotating mechanical energy has now been converted into electrical energy because the movement of electrons through a wire is electricity. In what's called a combined cycle power plant, the gas turbine can be used in combination with a steam turbine to generate 50% more power. The hot exhaust generated from the gas turbine is used to create steam and a boiler, which then spins the steam turbine blades with their own drive shaft that turns the generator. What you end up with is the most efficient system for converting fuel into energy. And that's your GE Gas Turbine 101. The gas turbine has a section where it brings in the air. That wasn't emphasized in the video, but typically it's just brought in, and then it has to turn and go into the compressor section, and that is emphasized in the video. That's where it's quote-unquote squeezed. It's going to a higher pressure. Now, this is why you take fluid mechanics. There's other reasons why you take fluid mechanics, but this got rotating and stationary blades that are catching it, slinging it toward the next group who turn it, then next blades, catch it, sling it, and that's in the compressor. Now, back, back in here, there's a series of uh, uh, combustors that are surround the whole uh, section, and here they're showing one with the flame in it. Some air is brought up, and then you have the high rate of combustion in that uh, canister, and that's a combustion system. Now it's not only at high pressure, but it's now at high temperature, and it's ready to go through a set of blades that are like the compressor, but they're to extract mechanical energy out of it, dropping the pressure, dropping the temperature. Here, they want to extract it down to ambient pressure. It's still going to be warm as it needs to exhaust, but they want to get as much into the shaft that comes back here ready to couple up to a generator. So the mechanical energy in the shaft drives the compressor. Some of it's driving the compressor, but then a lot comes back here to drive the electric generator. All right. So the main components are compressor, combustor, turbine. Then they exhaust this. Now we're going to talk about a combined cycle power plant where you exploit this high temperature exhaust gases to maybe into a, a, a vapor power cycle to make more power. That is the combined cycle power plant. That's state of the art. That's what everybody's building. But we're just going to start with the study of exhausting it now. So now this is always confusing to a student. They'll give you the information about the pressure exiting the compressor and the pressure incoming and they'll call this the pressure ratio 
it is not the same as the compression ratio. Notice the difference. Pressure ratio. What did we study before? Compression ratio. I'm just going to point out, this is a compressor. They describe the pressure ratio across the compressor. Why don't they describe the compression ratio across the compressor? They don't. Just get used to it, okay? <laughs> don't make the mistake on the final exam. They'll say the pressure ratio across the compressor is 9. And you know how many students will put R is equal to 9. And then they'll be thinking of diesel and auto cycle. No, you've now shifted. Now we're studying Brayton cycle, and the compressor is described to have a pressure ratio across it. Very confusing. But just as long as you get it straight in your mind, you're okay. Now, this is now the high side. The pressure at 3 is equal to the pressure at 2, just like the pressure at 1 is equal to the pressure at 4. So you only have the high side, high side pressure, and the low side pressure. What does the combustor do? It just adds heat. Do the it does not increase the pressure. It's just a heat addition. And the turbine exploits the pressure difference as well as the temperature difference to extract work. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do an analysis of the compressor. What did I just draw around it? A CV. Then we're going to do an analysis around the combustor. What did I just draw? A CV. Then we're going to do analysis around the turbine. I just drew a CV. What does CV stand for? Control volume. Do I have fluid flowing in across the boundary of the control volume? And then I have some fluid flowing out across the boundary of the control volume? Yeah, but you know how many people are going to say, oh, gas turbine. Let me write the first law for a closed system undergoing a process from initial state one to final state two. You'll have to slow down and say, I need to do a first law analysis for an open system, not a closed system. I need to do it for control volume with mass flow rate in and out. Okay? So let's do this. Let's put the work out of here, W dot out of the compressor, as positive out. I know it's not positive out. It's a compressor. It's going to be a work consuming, power consuming device. Let's write the first law for the compressor. Rate of change of energy in the control volume surrounding the compressor with respect to time is the rate at which it's flowing in with heat. Hey, I'm going to have an adiabatic compressor. You're right. That's going to be zero. Minus W dot outside the control volume. Oh, that's the positive work power out. Got it. Plus, now we're going to put the M dot, and I know we could have in and out, but it's going to be steady state. And so the M dot's in equal to M dot out, just one M dot, and you have the change in enthalpy, the enthalpy coming in at one, going out at two, the kinetic energy in at 1, kinetic energy out at 2, the potential energy in at 1, potential energy out at 2, closed parent. And we're going to neglect changes of potential and kinetic energy, standard assumptions. It's adiabatic, it's steady state. And so we can get a equation, which is W dot divided by M dot, this is for the compressor, is equal to H1 minus H1. Two. You see that? That's the type of thing you need to know from Thermal 1. So it's a little review, but, but okay. The enthalpy at state 2, do you think it's higher than the enthalpy at state 1 or lower? Clicker question, huh? Uh, A, it's higher. Uh, B, it's lower. B, it's lower. What is the relationship between the enthalpy at state 2 at the exit of the compressor compared to the inlet? Is H2 greater than H1? Answer A. If H2 is less than H1, answer B. Professor, make your 2s look like 2s. Okay, fine. I'm going to make it look like a 2. And we'll show the result. And H1, H2 is higher. It's greater. More energy is because it's been compressed. Higher pressure, higher temperature at the exit of the compressor. All right, very good. Because H2 is greater than H1, isn't this lowercase wc going to be negative? 
what do you mean lowercase wc? Lowercase wc is w dot c for the compressor divided by the mass flow rate through it. What units are that? Kilojoules per kilogram. You're used to that. All right. We're going to do the same thing for each of those components. Let me do this, though. Introduce the air standard analysis for the Brayton cycle. Okay. Air standard is just like what we did for the auto and diesel. The combustion is too complex. Let's just replace it by heat addition in the burner. Let's replace the, uh, the closed loop and just do a heat rejection in another heat exchanger that doesn't exist physically, but in analysis it closes the loop. It's always air. It always obeys the ideal gas law plus U is a function of T only, H is a function of T only. All these are standard. If they see ideal in front of it, what's it saying about the isentropic efficiency of that compressor and the isentropic efficiency of the turbine? 100%. You can relax that, but then it won't be ideal anymore. It'll still be an air standard analysis of the Brayton cycle. If they say it's a cold, well, then use constant specific heats evaluated at 25C. All right. So we already did this one. So we're going to show this as W out of the compressor, and it's going to be negative, And that's equal to H1 minus H2. All right. How about the first law around the burner? You get Q into the burner. Now I could put, and sometimes I will call it a combustor, and I'll put Q sub C. But then somebody will say, is that Q sub C for the compressor or Q sub C? Okay, fine. Get rid of the C for combustor and call it B for burner. I don't, I don't want to be confusing. C, subscript C is already for compressor. Let's use subscript C B for the burner. Okay. This is going to be positive in, it'll be H3 minus H2 with a little work. What do you do? How did you get that? First law analysis, control volume, steady state. And now we're going to have the work coming out of that turbine. That's going to be the enthalpy 3 minus enthalpy 4, and that'll be positive. You can just think through all these. This needs to be negative. This is positive up here. This one's negative, not negative, positive. WT is positive. And now this last one, I'm going to show it down here like this. I'm going to call this just um, here, Q of the heat exchanger. That's going to be negative, and it's going to be the H1 minus H4. You've got to get the first law right for all of them. Okay. You're also going to do a second law analysis. It, you're going to assume for the second law that it's adiabatic and reversible. Hence, guess what the relationship between S2 and S1 is. If it's adiabatic and reversible compression, it's isentropic. Likewise, if the turbine has no irreversibilities and it's adiabatic, then S3 is equal to S4. Now, as soon as you start giving a 80% isentropic efficiency for this compressor or for this turbine, then you, know, you have to do it in a two-step process. Calculate the work, use the efficiency, then adjust the isentropic work to the actual work. So we want to be able to do the first law and the second law, as well as draw on a TS diagram. I've already done the second, first law. The second law I showed you, it really only comes into play for the compressor and the turbine and then they're isentropic. But let's go ahead and sketch a temperature entropy diagram. Temperature entropy, first of all, you remember there's two lines of pressure. One was the high pressure, one was the low pressure. The high pressure is state 2 and state 3 in the combustor or burner, and this was P1 is equal to P4, that's the low pressure. All right, so we'll start at the low pressure. And we'll put it through isentropic to state 2 at the higher pressure. Notice the temperature goes up. Not only the pressure goes up, the temperature goes up. Then we heat it up to the final T3. Notice T3 is higher than T2. It's hot after the burner. Then we expand it isentropically down to 4 and close the loop. There's the cycle on a TS diagram. What do we know about this process from 1 to 2? S is equal to a constant. Then we have pressure is constant. S is equal to a constant. Pressure is equal to a constant.
that helps you. You have a good image, your components, you have your diagram, TS diagram, you have your first and second law, you can solve a problem. Now, we have used a lot of these equations, these last two equations, ideal gas undergoing isentropic process, constant specific heat. Because the auto and the diesel cycle used compression ratio, cutoff ratio, we use them a lot. But now we shift gears and we're studying the Brayton cycle, same chapter. How do they describe that compressor? Not with a ratio of specific volumes, but a ratio of pressure. Hence, this is our new favorite equation. So our new favorite equation has this P2 over P1, K to the K minus 1 over K exponent. That's our new favorite equation for the Brayton, analyzing Brayton cycles. Okay. So when you're given a problem, air standard, Brayton, blah, 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 what are the steps in solving it? They're the same type of steps for the vapor power cycle, same type of steps for the auto, same type of steps for the diesel, and now the same for the Brayton. What do you do? Make a sketch of your components and label your states. Now, in the auto and diesel, it was thinking about processes between state one and two, the piston is you know, moving from state one to state two to compression process. Here it's the components and the flow goes through the compressor, then through the burner. Sketch your TS diagram, we've done that. Get a table of your properties. Know your temperature, your pressure. If you're doing it, accounting for variable specific heats, you're gonna use P sub R's and U's and H's. Actually, forget the U's here, it'll be H's. And then the table of your energy transfers. Once you have that, check that your Q net's equal to work net and solve for whatever they ask you to solve for. Make sense? I hope that strategy is clear. Um, so we have this problem, and we have it for a cold air standard analysis, and you have constant specific heats given, and we're ready to solve this problem. You ready to go? All right. So we start at the pressure and the temperature. I've already sketched that temperature entropy diagram, so let me not take up room here. You have it in your notes. The next one is, is get a table of properties. How many states do I have? State one, that's the inlet to the compressor. State two, the outlet of the compressor, inlet to the burner. Then state three, et cetera, state four. You know the pressure in kilopascal, the temperature, in Kelvin. Let's put in our uh, 90 and our 300. And then they also tell us that the compressor pressure ratio is 9. Did they just say that P2 divided by P1 is 9? Yes. That's the compressor pressure ratio. This is tricky wording. Pressure ratio. Okay. Can you tell me what is P2? 9 times 90, isn't it? Yeah, 810. A little bit of work, but you got P2. How do I get T2? Well, I remember T2 divided by T1 is P2 divided by P1 raised to the K minus 1 over K. Hey, that was one of my favorite <laughs> equations. It works only for ideal gas. It works only with isentropic process. works only with constant specific heats. There you go. All those three conditions apply. So the T2 turns out to be my T1, 300 Kelvin, times 9 to the K minus 1, that's 0.4, divided by 1.4. How many people have a calculator? Can they run that quick? I'll look up what I think the answer should be and then compare. That sounds right. So it turns out to be 562. Now, when you go back and look at your temperature entropy diagram, they say the maximum temperature is 1600. Isn't T3 the maximum temperature? Yeah, it is. How about uh, P3? P3. Is it equal to P2? It's through that bust combustor or burner. Constant pressure? Yeah, it's 8, 810. Very good. All right, what about uh, P4? Back down to 90. 
Yeah, P1. How about the temperature? Well, you're going to use this equation, but slightly different. It'll be that it's a T4 is equal to 1600, one-ninth of 0.4 divided by 1.4. Because you're not compressing it, an additional factor of 9, you have a pressure reduction. So that comes in 854. Still toasty hot. All right, once I have those, I want to get a table of my... Uh, transfers my Q in kilojoule per kilogram and my W in kilojoule per kilogram for a component. Uh, let's do the compressor, let's do the burner, let's do the turbine, and let's do this just heat rejector, you know, heat exchanger to reject the heat to the atmosphere. All right, so some of these are zero. Isn't it uh, adiabatic compression in the compressor? The burner has no work. The turbine's adiabatic, and heat exchangers no work. I got half the table filled in. You do the rest. Ah, <laughs> I did the easy half. Okay, so we come back and we say, for the compressor, isn't this my H2 uh, one, two minus H, well, H1 minus H2 to get the right sign? Um, we did that before. H1 minus H2, it turns out to be negative, and it comes in to negative 263.2. 3 kilojoules per kilogram. All right. That for the burner, it's going to be a positive 1043.2. That's just a change in enthalpies. Then for the turbine, 749.7. .7. The heat exchanger, negative 556.8. We do a sum of the Qs, 486.3. Sum for the W's, 486.3. If they're different, look for your error. They're the same. Q net's equal to work net for the cycle. Perfect. Finally, we can calculate the thermal efficiency of the cycle. It's the network, 486.3, divided by the heat that you had to pay for in the burner, 1043.2. And it comes in, the thermal efficiency of the cycle is around 40 6.6%. And then the back work ratio, well, what's that? Back work ratio is the negative of the negative 263.3, or just take the absolute value of that. That's how much had to go to feed the compressor, divided by what came out of the turbine, 749.7. It gives a back work ratio, I'll just write it up here, very low, or not too low, 35.1%. I rushed a little bit, but I think it's doable. Here are some numbers. Obviously, I solved the problem before I came to class. Uh, that's usually recommended by, for instructors. 